Welcome to the Foo Fight Podcast and our final full fat episode of 2020, a year that has been like no other. I'm Matt Eastland. And I'm Lakshmi Balathasan. And we're both from EIT Food, Europe's leading food innovation community working hard to make the food system more sustainable, healthy and trusted. So last time we looked at the various ways that COVID-19 pandemic has shaken up the agri-food industry for better and for worse. But as the vaccines begin to roll out, we want to spend time optimistically looking into 2021 to discuss the emerging food trends, innovations and thinking that is likely to shape the year to come. Yeah, so to chat through the opportunities, we're joined by two very special guests. First is food and drink analyst Edward Bergen, who joins us from the renowned global research company Mintel. Edward is a well-known speaker in this area, and we're really excited to have you on. So thank you very much for joining us, Edward. Thanks so much for having me. Looking forward to it. Great stuff. And our second guest is one of our secret weapons at EIT Food and one of my favorite colleagues. It's Annick Fervin. I hope I said that right, Annick. Uh, Annick is well known for having her finger on the pulse as manager of the Rising Food Stars Association, which helps accelerate and support high potential scale ups in this space. In other words, Annick knows about some of the coolest new projects before anyone else. So thanks very much for having us, Annick. Nice to be here. Great. Looking forward to it. Yeah, and thanks for returning, Annick. So I think you were on the podcast with me last year in Lisbon where you stepped into Lakshmi's shoes. So yeah. uh, it, this is a new, from from uh, host to guest. On the other side. Now at least I can say what I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I'm We're scared. looking forward to that. <laughs> okay, great. So just to, just to kind of set the scene. So Edward, can you tell us a little bit about the type of work you do and, and why, especially in a time like this, that the study of trends is so important. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I work in a food and drink platform team for Mintel. So I I'm, I'm spend half my time writing and analysing consumer data, innovation data, menu data and sales and so on to try and you know, spot opportunities for our clients. And we have many at Mintel. And then the rest of the time is actually talking to those clients about you know, their own specific requests or briefs or um, whatever's coming up. So I spend some of my time writing specifically about sauces, seasonings, flavors, and, and spreads. And um, some of my time writing sort of more general, big picture trend sort of pieces that cover different categories. So always trying to spot what's next has kind of been our, our latest aim at Mintel, just really trying to shift towards that future um, mm. rather than maybe sticking on what's happening now. So hopefully I'll be able to help on this one. And, and given that there is so much data out there, you know, at Mintel in your role, so how do you identify the areas which are actually worth studying? Because you must be drowning in data all the time. Yeah, we, we have a lot. So I think that uh, the crux of our product and what we do, um, we speak to consumers in 35 countries, asking them sort of big picture questions like this year was a big year because we asked them about impact of COVID. But in some of those 35 countries, we get into every single category across different industries, asking about, you know, attitudes to chocolate, concerns about sugar. And if you're talking about that category, um, what do you want? Want from innovation? Um, do you want to spend more um, to buy you know, a, a sustainable claim? All sorts of different questions we ask, which is why we work in sort of category groups as well, so that we can really get in depth on a particular mm -hmm. space. Um, but the other half of our business is, is this huge innovation database we have called the Global New Product Database. And we're able to, I think we're buying from 100 plus countries now, physical products, and we do some internet scraping too, where they come into our system and we track every single ounce of information from a pack. Um, but then when you've got 30,000 bars of chocolate over five years, you can actually start to see how the claims change because we'll track claims on pack, packaging size and so on. So we can see low, no sugar is growing as just an right. example, as a percentage of launches per year. So that helps us understand, you know, new trends appearing on the market. And when you're getting into the kind of the future stuff, you can start to maybe see things like an ingredient change that's just up and coming this year, and then make a prediction based on using where are we now versus what's going to happen next. So lots of different ways 
I could go all day talking about it. <laughs> I'm sure you can. And we'll get into the more detailed stuff later. But thanks for that. It's really useful. And I guess, Anna, for you know, trends are definitely important in terms of your rising food stars. But before we get into that, can you explain a little bit about you, your role managing rising food stars and really the relevance of keeping up with trends? Yes, definitely. And thanks for that. Um, I think what is important to know is what we do within rising food stars is we try to be the gateway to young scale-ups, as you mentioned, to powerful business connections and really opening doors to them, all kinds of opportunities. So we think, or at least we select our rising food stars because we believe that they are impactful young scale-ups, very often with a tech focus, uh, so not so much the brand, but much more the technology behind it. And we think, or we firmly believe that these are the companies that will make a positive impact on the food system. We support them and specifically them because we are fully convinced that these are companies who have an amazing tech background and they really know how that works. But they, because of that long timeline that they have into creating that impact, they need support, extra business support, extra easy opening of doors. And that's what we provide with them. So and I'm just lucky to be in the midst of this very dynamic group of young companies and on a daily basis, try to make connections with corporates, with investors, with, with funding opportunities, just always in the middle of dynamic interaction. And I guess with respect, you know, what uh, Ever is saying and the importance of trends, like how relevant is it for your skill ups to keep up to date with these trends? the food sector? Well, I think it's crucial. It's crucial for every young business. If you don't follow the trends and even more important, if you can't be well informed about the trends before they are there, it's so difficult to catch up. So, so it's important for them to know, to know well in advance and to tailor their technology towards a specific trend that is very important for the consumer. Because I do think in the food system, however you turn it, whether you B2B, B2C, in the end, you always need somebody who wants to buy what you are part of. Exactly. And I guess, especially for startups, you always have to be that fortune teller, right? Always have to be reading what's coming up in the future and trends are absolutely important. Mm. I agree. And so just talking about like... um trends that we've we've seen bef- seen in the past i guess so one one big trend that stood out for me a couple of years ago is that you know everybody started taking photos on instagram and overnight everybody came over became like a food blogger right and as a result we saw the food industry kind of shift as a result of that so reformulating products to make them more instagram worthy and more visual more oozy changing the size and shape so just as one example that came from an unexpected place. So Edward, do you have any thoughts on other key trends over the past few years that have made lasting shifts in the agri-food sector? Yeah, firstly, that trend, we call it eat with your eyes. That's one of our mental trends. Eyes, so okay. That's not, not going anywhere at all. Um, I think one that we've been tracking for a while, you guess you could call it as you know a big theme of sort of the sustainability side, but we've been tracking um, something, we, I guess we, we gave it a name last year. We called it high tech harvests. And if we talk mm. about the agri-food sector and how, and I think actually COVID-19 has really helped it. Maybe this wouldn't tick along, but how consumers are going to need to be convinced a little bit more that it's okay for science to get involved in our food production. Kind of the simple one. We were a bit scared of, of too much science in our food. That We had this big trend of naturalness for ages. But actually, whether that was down to the... Is it bad to have something that's maybe been made in an artificial way? And we didn't really know or consumers didn't really know. So putting a natural unpack was like, OK, this is therefore clean and it's how I should be eating because it's not been tampered with in any way. But we have this trend, High Tech Harvest, which we're going to be tracking we call it a 2030 trends for us. And it was looking at new ways to source and produce. A great example will be an underground farm under a London tube station. That's mm. kind of the perfect way. And, you know, there are examples out there where you can just use the lighting. You don't need to tamper with the actual seeds or ingredients. You can just change the lighting to actually shift how a product grows. You know, we had examples of kale being made, uh, grown, not bitter, just using the lighting in an underground farm. So right? wow. n- not not only that, but, you know, having an underground farm means that you're growing in a place that you weren't before. And if we're all becoming more urban and consumers moving into cities and climate change impacting our environment outside of cities, and it's the future. And that was just one example, but there are so many others. I'll just give you one other great one that I saw, the impact that having a 3D printer in the middle of a desert 
somewhere like Africa, where access to new technology isn't as quick and easy, and that maybe you could 3D print a new part for a machine. And in the past, you'd have had to order it from the other side of the world and it'd be delivered and so on. And now you'd be able to 3D print it, you know, next door. So Amazing. small changes to the industry that will help us grow in new locations. And that's not to mention vertical farms and, and so on that are also connected to this. But those are two quite funky examples. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, thanks for setting that up. I mean, I'd, I'd really like to talk more about the the kind of food and tech side and those trends later, because, you know, it does seem to me that you're right, you know, people are concerned about food and tech. And yet, I suppose, if you look back across the, the evolution of the agri-food sector, everything we've done has basically been food and tech. You could even argue that pasteurization is food and tech at one point. So I think this is something which has always been with us. But um, yeah, let's let's talk about that. I guess, Edward, you mentioned the year that was 2020. And if we really focus on this year of disruption, there's obviously been a lot of changes forced upon us. So, Anik, you know, speaking specifically about the scale-up, so how has the last year changed the focus of the scale-ups we've been working with? Yeah, I, I think it's a combination of two things. It's been a hard year for young companies, that in general, right? It, it's um, everything, um, COVID, the consequences on that, uh, markets being closed, opportunities they could not chase, investors who freezed investments. So they had a lot of struggles. For some of them, it was an opportunity to redirect what they did. And I guess in one of the previous podcasts, you also had Swiss Decode. They work on uh, food sanitation and delivering safe products. They really tuned one of their products specifically to detecting COVID um, in manufacturing principle and how they could change that. For other ones, it's almost been an opportunity because I do mm -hmm. think that due to COVID, suddenly um, everybody um, was confronted by the fact that taking food every day and buying what you want to buy every day is not so straightforward anymore. Eh? We all mm -hmm. remember going to the supermarkets. Um, here in Belgium, it was the toilet paper. Eh? There's always something. <laughs> but yeah, suddenly, so you, you could not buy what you were used to buy for 50 years, all the time, everywhere. So and I think it, it for a lot of them, it also offered an opportunity there to say, OK, how can we make this food system more robust? Suddenly, the food sector was like the main sector where that needed to be protected. It was the, one of the few things that kept on going and going. So I think for a lot of them, it also offered opportunities in having the clear visibility of doing things more transparent, um, mm. more healthy and more sustainable. And I do think mm. here, as always, the information of the consumer has become more crucial. It's more about them telling the story. Uh, we, ha we had a couple of years ago where you had a brand and it was a nice story and people bought it. Now I think people are even more aware and more crucial about what they eat and why they eat it. However, you always still have this convenience angle. Don't, we don't want to give that up. And I think that yeah. offers opportunities for a lot of them. The convenience angle is very interesting because you'd have said two years ago, convenience was food to go, going into mm -hmm. a supermarket and being able to get your, you know, your meal to go and you're just quick top up shops, small packs, really easy to sort of carry around. And we've shifted from convenience out of home to convenient cooking convenience in the home and it's sort of brought new opportunities for small brands that could align to that we know that meal kits have done quite well this year mm. and we had a great veg delivery service called odd box that used odd wonky fruit and veg that's done really well this year um my favorite one of this year has been the impact that consumers have been buying small appliances and we know that black friday's just happened and small appliances did quite well and we've seen sales of like bread makers and instant pots really grow hmm. And there was a really cool example from William Sonoma in the United States. I think they're like a, a retailer, but they have a really big private label range. And they did an instant pot range because they realized consumers, actually, they're not thinking about, I need to cook tonight. They're thinking, I need to cook in my instant pot. I'm still going to cook. I don't want a ready meal. But so they're actually just saying, buy all the ingredients in this pack. It says instant pot on it and just pop it in and we'll give you the recipe on pack. So it's just a slight shift in That's how we're communicating to consumers and like small changes this year have brought really good opportunities like that. And is that one of the that kind of convenience factor? Is that one of the things that you picked up on the that your Mintel 2030 global food and drinks trends? And, and has anything else in there, get, I guess, changed as a result of COVID or accelerated? That one 
probably wasn't picked because we did our 2030s last year and that one we because the convenience was just ticking along food to go mm. we thought it was always going to have its place we were getting into things like meal kits they were starting to grow and that was sort of picked up more automation consumers being able to get more personalized with the products that they want and helping people to semi-scratch cook without having to you know do it totally from buying raw ingredients so we did pick that up but the impact of COVID has helped that one tick along. Um, I think that this year, especially that we're now going to be trusting in, you know, science more and vaccines. I think mm. it's going to help consumers, uh, um, you know, trust in new methods of production more. So we talked about science already, but consumers will be will will hear that you know cultivated meat's been grown in a lab and they're now you know, safe to eat, and they might actually believe that and go, okay, that's not weird because it's okay because a scientist said it's okay. When maybe last year it was more thinking that an influencer says it's a bit weird to eat it, and actually they're not qualified to to tell you anything. So I think there's going to be a renewed trust. In science again, especially if science is what saves us, which is clearly going to happen. So um, that's definitely helped drive some of these, the, the 2030 trends, the, the science, those sort of high-tech harvest trends. Yeah, lot. that's really interesting. I mean, I've obviously thought about, you know, COVID accelerating certain trends, but I never thought about the kind of parallel there that because there's been so much talk about science, because of all the vaccines coming through COVID, that actually that would then support people's acceptance of uh, sort of science and tech in the agri-food industry. That's really interesting. As you say, going into next year with all the vaccines going, maybe this will start to uh, sort of tick upwards. So you've pulled that one on convenience there, but just uh, before we kind of dig into the, the real sort of categories of trends, just from both of you, what, what have been your like quick headline trends that you've seen this year, whether it's across the industry or from startups? So convenience, we said, was one. But uh, I mean, Anik, what have you seen from a startup and scale up perspective? I think there are two things very clear. It's everything that is personalized diets, smart diets, call it whatever you want. Mm-hmm. And the fact that again, science and tech together can mean something for you and I as an individual consumer. And it's different for me than it is for you than it is for Edward, for example. So there's a lot of opportunities and things going on there. And then a personal soft spot for me is everything that's related to, uh, again, the high-tech ag um, and also the regenerative agriculture. Uh, really, instead of just using the soil, then leave it there to, to know it and nourish it. And it's the basis of everything. And there's so many good things happening there that can have an impact. So many cool startups doing stuff there. Cool. Thanks. So I've got a funky one, which is um, you could talk about the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, I guess mm. this year for for many people, the bottom layer, the idea of safety mm. and survival has been essential. So while, you know, sustainability is going to come back in a vengeance, I reckon it's been on pause a little bit. But one of the things that's come out of it is you might call it sanitary theatre or safety theatre. How brands show that they're clean and I don't mean clean in terms of their label, that their environment is clean. Mm. And there's been this new trend about that our products have been well washed, our staff have got gloves on, our, we're wearing face masks, we wear the right PPE. And I love how they're using that to, to advertise and market themselves now. So you'll see things which will help maybe certain new products come to market when they're they're making sort of lab grown products. They can or or cultivated meat, as we said, and um, they can say actually this is a cleaner method of producing, and that they'll play on the theatre of the the cleanliness. We know that you know go to Deliveroo, that's what they're all about. They're about you know you're going to have touch free. You know they're going to leave it at the door, knock and stand away from the, your front door. So little simple trends, but actually just to give consumers that confidence that everything's safe. Um, that's been a nice one for 2020, which may not survive forever. Yeah. yeah so maybe people will, will move away from Instagramming uh, their food to Instagramming like the cleanliness of their kitchen. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, weird one. But there are great examples on that. Yeah. Eh? Specifically, I, there's a company within my network, ScanTrust, and that's what they do. You as a consumer can take an end product, you take a picture of the code, and you have that transparency through all the whole line. So we, we've been talking about connecting all these parts of the value chain already for a long time. I think that's not a new trend. But now really in a transparent way, communicating it towards the consumer and you know what, really meaning it. I don't mean the green washing principle, really showing what you do in an honest and transparent way. There's so many opportunities there. I think the, a lot of the power of this is still with the consumer and they are they are 
wanting to be informed. They want to know what they eat for what reasons. Yeah. So yeah, trust and transparency seems to be a big a big trend which is emerging. Okay, I think we're now already moving into the the deep dive areas. So why don't we have a look at this? So looking into next year and beyond then, uh, I mean, there is so much that we could talk about here. So we've tried to kind of categorize some some key areas. Um, so if I give you the area, could you both just give me your thoughts on the trends for 2021 and maybe any companies to watch out for? So this will be interesting. So if I just said like health, so obviously given everything's going on with COVID, people are thinking a lot more about their health and well-being. But how has this sort of manifested itself as a trend in the sector. Edward, what do you think? A few different things are going on. I think looking at what's happened this year, consumers have realised that they're vulnerable and they've realised that they're not going to live forever. Um, we know that the, the the virus, for example, has attacked consumers with um, diabetes, and they're you know they've been there's been concerns about that. So it's helped bring you know make consumers think a bit more about their overall health. And we think there's going to be um, I guess a renewed push on long term health. There's been um, things like immunity claims. Vitamin D has been been brought to the market. We already had digestion, digestive claims growing, but then links made, whether they're proved or not, to that also helping your immune system. You know, I'm currently drinking kombucha here. Um, not for any other reason that it tastes amazing. Um, <laughs> and so that's from, from one side, there is going to be some consumers, they're going to be thinking, actually, I do need to think about my long term health. But but and this is where it's fun to talk about trends because that doesn't mean that indulgence is going anywhere. Mm. Um, mm. And we've got a trend this year, which is uh, for 2021. We've called it, I guess, feed the mind. And this link to emotional health is going to grow even more. As in, this has been a bad year for mental health. Mm. But actually mm. next year, I think it's going to be a great year um, to to sort of fight back against mental health. Hopefully consumers coming back together, having fun and enjoying company of others, but also that it's okay to have a treat moment because it's mm. going to keep you going and keep you smiling. Um, so there's going to be this, I think, balance will come back into focus that you do need to think about your long-term health, but at the same time, you know, indulgent brands have a role to play and also hopefully new claims related to, you know, brain health and your, you know, relaxation and, and so on. Um, tea plays in that space already, but other categories are definitely going to be, you know, getting into it. So health is massive mm. um, and there's different ways to do it. Actually, indulgence can have a role in it too. That's interesting. So it's like, food in enhancing our mood because it's it's good for us and it makes us feel better but it's also about food enhancing our well-being that if you're having something which you really enjoy whether that's an indulgence or not that actually has a positive mental well-being perspective that's really interesting so what about you Anik from a sort of startup or scale up perspective particularly amongst your community what what are you seeing from a health perspective i i can just agree on what edward said i think there's a lot of asking now about everything that enhances immunity. Uh, so we have all these different food sources, but also already existing products who are now enhanced to have a, a better influence. Um, two things there. There's always a bit of a question about the added value of a real mm -hmm. claim, a health claim. For consumers, they're quite confusing and how to solve that. So we have some companies who really work on that, how to nicely address a claim towards a consumer and make this transparency so everybody understands if you buy something that it makes sense. Another thing I do think, and there I can uh, um, give the example of Louis, one of the new rising food stars, it's really, um, again, that we are need, need certain things and so we want to buy products who are tailored according to our needs. In this case, it's a grouping of vitamin supplements, but it can so much further. Uh, um, Smart with Food, another company linked to one of the bigger retailers. It's, an, it's as easy as an app that you have on your phone, whereby you say, OK, mm -hmm. this is what I want to eat. I have a deficiency in this and this, or I want more of this and this. And whoop, you get your package fully online with what you need to buy, the amount, and what are the good products to enhance you with that. Two very yeah, interesting amazing. things. It really happening. sounds like they're enabling making the healthy choice the easy choice. That's really interesting. Convenience always, Lakshmi. Mm. No, yeah, absolutely. I guess, you know, moving on uh, from health, you know, the big thing, you know, we just recently just heard about Eat Just and 
lab grown chicken meat being available in Singapore, like really exciting for the sector. So yeah, let's talk about meat alternatives and alternative proteins. What are you seeing? What are your thoughts in 2021 and beyond? So this isn't even a trend anymore. This is mainstream. Mm. The, the idea that we should be reducing our meat consumption. We just got some stats for the UK and we it says that it's still about 1.6% of people that say they're vegan. And it doesn't sound very much. And the market yeah. still talks about the vegans. And while they're really helping sort of provide noise and help innovation tick along, actually, it's not about them. And they're just loving the roller coaster and the ride. Um, we've got 41% of consumers, this is in the UK, who say they're reducing the amount of meat they eat. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's about, this is this trend is about them. And we're going to get to a point where, coupled with um, everything going on, you know, with our populations growing and so on, are we going to have enough meat to actually feed everybody? We, we know that plant-based and potentially lab-grown is going to have to help to feed us. So... The big issue now is can you convince the consumer that it's okay to eat? Does it taste as good? That's mm. got to be the main thing. You know, you look at plant-based now compared to five years ago. Five years ago, it was bland and dreadful. No one really wanted to eat it unless they were forced to. Um, and now it tastes really good. Um, we've got Tesco's Wicked Kitchen naming themselves Wicked Kitchen and putting things like seasonings in the range. Yes, they're plant-based, but it's just about providing flavour and fun. And that's what we want to start to see happen more, that we shift away from these things are new and science and about a particular diet. And actually, it's about the standard average mainstream consumer who's still going to eat meat, you know, through the week, but they are happily, you know, moving to new meals. And this is going to help cultivated meat really drive. If they can make it taste good, um, we know that all the fast food joints are doing it. The first fast food joint that gets a cultivated meat product in their, you know, burger. Mm-hmm. And if it tastes nice, they're going to win. And it's going to be an amazing story and consumers will try it and they'll probably enjoy it. So it's a really good future for this space. Yeah, exciting trend. And also it spawned a new word that I came across as part of the research for this podcast, labriculture, which uh, was a new one on me, which I actually really quite like. It's quite nice. And I completely agree with your point about the fun element because I'm still a bit baffled, like, you know, veggie burgers and veggie dogs have been around for years and now it's trendy and sexy well, they and, taste nice now. Yeah. and they taste <laughs> nice and it's that fun element right like what you said like it's making um going veggie a bit more mainstream so i guess on the same topic to you Anik, what are you seeing like you have a number of companies in this space yeah. so what are the ones that you've been keeping an eye on yeah indeed yeah we've we've had a lot of them and i think this is specifically the sector who has a positive impact of covid right uh, the fact that everything started in the slaughterhouses suddenly alternative proteins are even more important than they already are as mm-hmm. edward said they're mainstream i think what happened now in singapore is going to change things at a huge pace and i also have for example moza meat one of the rising food stars just closed their 75 million series b wow. to really wow. produce a factory in the netherlands to do it and and to step away from the whole discussions and the lab thing that we had the last couple of years And I fully agree on the tasting. I think, again, taste is king always. That's what we buy. We buy something we like um, and all the rest is good, but still it has to taste good. So I even have Piece of Meat, a company, and they cultivate fat, not animal, just animal fat. So you can add it to certain products to have that specifically juicy taste and all of its love. Um, But I do think... Yes, it's still meat, right? Um, It's cultivated in a more sustainable way on the long term. Hopefully, it also becomes economically um, feasible. But on the other hand, we also have all these plant-based proteins, um, but also so many different things are happening. Mycoprotein now um, being scaled up to really have your mycoburgers, alternative protein from waste streams, which is maybe an even more exciting theme because it's more than just making a plant-based protein, it's also Mm. using something that otherwise is thrown away. And I think that for me is extra exciting. If you can really close the circle fully, Mm. that's great. So Mm. Napiferain is the perfect company. These are all companies who are raising a lot of money on the short term, really building factories and stepping away of the whole um, story that things should do different, they really do them differently. And you bring up a, a kind of another theme that we'd like to talk about, Anik, which is, so you mentioned food waste, and I guess we're sort of moving into that 
sustainability sphere. So, you know, we've had the year after kind of uh, Greta and she's had a huge impact on, on the kind of uh, people's perception about the environment. Uh, we've had COVID, people staying at home, which is, you know, maybe focusing people's minds more on things like food waste. But from a startup perspective, what's the trend here in sustainability and is this accelerating? Well, I think you see three different things, right? And, and it's like the Maslow pyramid. Yes, you have companies who take a waste uh, principle and turn it into something that creates value. No waste streams anymore. We don't even use the word anymore, right? We use side streams and we make something of it. Mm -hmm. But is if you can just reduce the waste. So in there we see two different things. Companies who really focus a lot on packaging uh, because we can say a lot of things about packaging, but still us as convenient consumers want to buy something that we can keep for a while before we use it. So we need packaging anyway. So a lot of great examples there. Mimica is a company um, working on that. Tipa made a compostable packaging. Uh, both of them really on the go now and doing pilots with, uh, with big corporates. And then you have the third thing, like really, can't you just produce without creating waste? And then there's no need for that anymore, just the avoidance of waste. Mm -hmm. um, and there we have companies like Wasteless, the name says it by themselves, uh, who have a technology which makes it easier in the supermarket, again, to have the convenient choice that you just pick the package that you're going to eat that day and not the one that really annoys me when I'm in the supermarket where you have people just dragging their salad all the way to the back of the mm. shelf just to take the one even if they're going to eat it that day. I know, so if you can so just strange, take that out. Yeah, and actually we've had, I think of all the, the three the examples you gave there, I think we've had them all on the show. So good to know that <laughs> we're on trend as well. <laughs> um, it. And what about you, Edward? What, uh, from a sustainability perspective, you've spoken about this a bit, but what, what are your big trends? So there's, there's a, a few. I, th I like the uh, using waste products, but I just wanted to share a really great example. I don't know if you guys are a fan of the, the, the Great British Crumpet. Um, there's a, yeah, you know, you're, you're thinking, where's he going with this? Um, we, th there was a really lovely example from a beer brand called Toast. You may have seen it. No, we um, had, we've brand. had them on the show, actually. And did they talk about their Warburton's collaboration? Um, I think we were, it was just a little bit ahead of that, but I then was following them and they were so, saying that they're now doing something with Warburton's, yeah. They're, they're picking up the waste wheat products to make a Warburton, like a, a, a crumpet flavoured beer or crumpet created beer. Amazing. Um, you know, think about all the taste, you know, examples mm. you're going to have on pack to entice a consumer. But just an example like that of what it represents. And then someone gets like a craft beer at the end of it that's, mm. you know, inspired by favorite brands. You know, I love that. Plus, it's got that amazing sustainability angle. Um, there's lots of things we've, we've, we've discussed from um, Intel Ocean Plastics and how, you know, plastics, are, we're going to have to get to a point where we see more brands reusing plastic that has been recycled. You know, we constantly hear in the media how we, we need to recycle more and brands need to put make their material recycled. But the amount of stuff that actually gets recycled once that you've, you know, it's gone to the wherever dump, recycled dump, is virtually nothing. Mm. And then, we, as I said, we can analyse our database. The number of products, which is tiny, minuscule percent or less than that say they reuse recycled plastic to make their packaging is it's so tiny and that's where an opportunity comes i know coca-cola in they've launched i think they've talked about they want to do this over the next sort of 30 years to get to a point where all their bottles are made out of at least reused or plant-based packaging that's one we're going to see a lot more of that but I think the the other side, this is where I, I get to talk about my beloved chickpea, is consumers understanding that some ingredients are better for the planet and for us, but better for the planet than others. Yeah. So you're getting something like the chickpea that feeds the soil while it's growing and it, and it doesn't use a huge amount of water compared to the almond, which has questionable levels. And I think that we're going to see more brands just celebrating ingredients and in the past it was about saying this ingredient tastes nice let's let's mention it unpack actually now it's saying you know eat chickpeas they taste amazing and also they the um, they're great for the planet and mm. they're great for you and that's definitely you know trend going forward the other one and we've got a trend this year called quality redefined which talks about what does quality mean to the consumer yeah it's got to be at a good price but it's telling them the story that we pay our farmers fairly that we we grow in an environment that's good 
for the soil there. We're not ruining environments. And so it's just going to expand more and more and more. Most of it's about you know, traceability and, and transparency from the brands. But also there will be brands that will just drop out because they can't keep up with consumers wanting this stuff really soon. Mm. I was going to say, it's interesting hearing you hear about the chickpeas because it's been such a staple diet for so many people, you know, from the East. And it's kind of interesting how that's kind of being incorporated now into the Western diet. Yeah, well, I've certainly seen something on like research wise that's saying like 2021 is meant to be the year of the chickpea, which, you know, I I don't know whether that's right or not, but it uh, certainly seems to be a a trend. Hope so. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, More hummus. hummus. (laughs) We have Innova Pro in our network. Tali will be really (laughs) loved hearing that. (laughs) That's, that's right. Tell us about Inevapro. Yeah, so so they're a, they're a company who are uh, making alternative proteins from chickpea, and they've been struggling now for quite some years in really explaining that um, that there is a sustainable added value to work with chickpeas, but they always have the economic and economics against yeah. them. So now, indeed, with this new trend, they have an opportunity. They also very recently raised, and now they're. For them, 2021 will definitely be a different year. Okay. That's amazing. Yeah, I feel like there's just so much disruption to like look forward in a positive way to look forward to um, as a result of the current situation. I'm just going to pick up on a little bit. I think you've both already touched a bit on like food packaging in terms of sustainability. But when I think of food packaging, you know, it's been the year of delivery-based food concepts. I think my son's first word is going to be delivery this year. Um, that, would, that would not be a good thing, Lakshmi. It's either going to be Alexa or it's going to be delivery. But um, Edward, so where do you see the whole delivery-based food concept going? Where is it going to go to drones? Um, that's kind of the latest. Um, this isn't going to go anywhere. People love the convenience of it. There will be a, hopefully a fight back to get people back sitting with their friends in restaurants again next year. Please, really want to sit at a restaurant with my friends. The delivery... I'm going to go to the Far East. When SARS happened 15, 20 years ago, um, there was this huge boost in capability of online comfort and shopping online. And they effectively gained a whole generation. You know, young people were starting to, but older consumers, not old consumers, older consumers began to use online services because they had to. And they never went back. And we've seen this year people like my parents who cannot use anything ordered online delivery for the first time. And they're in their 60s. They are the worst when it comes to tech. But yet their capability has hugely increased because they realise this is okay to do. Um, So what we've got is that we're not going to see a decline now in online delivery. It's not going anywhere. And that gives a whole host of opportunities to brands out there. And you might talk about startups in a minute because stuff like um, swiping up on Instagram and purchasing a product immediately or going to, uh, an example, BBC Good Food, finding a recipe, clicking add to basket, it goes to your supermarket basket and you can press go and you've got the recipe there. Loads of these new bits of technology that are helping consumers to shop. And then you've got your deliveries and your delivery services, which you know, you can have a really lovely food experience at home and um, not have to go out. Any, you know, there's so many opportunities here for space to go. And I think now if a brand is coming to market and they don't have an online plan, they won't Mm. succeed. Do you think that, so I'm just trying to think of the, the offset here. So lots of people obviously, you know, going for things like Deliveroo and having their food in, but there's also through COVID a trend for people to want to be doing more home cooking, home baking, sitting together down as a family. And, you know, we had um, Klaus from uh, Aarhus University on uh, a couple of weeks ago. He was talking about one of his reports that he's produced looking at these sorts of trends. And one of the big ones is people are, across Europe certainly, sitting down more as a family. So how does that kind of balance out? People are ordering more from the likes of Deliveroo and ordering online, yet at the same time cooking more at home. Do you think there's space for both? Yeah, I think so. I wonder how the ready meal market will do over the next few years. And well, there's these other sort of convenient semi scratch cooking, you know, products out there. I think there's space for both. Consumers have told us they've spent more time cooking this year when Mm -hmm. we asked them about the impact of COVID. And they say that they're going to do more next year, especially very young consumers, like 16 to 19 year olds have cooked for the first time ever. And we had some data about kids and cooking a couple of years ago, and it was pretty dreadful. You know, they, they do not know how to cook. And actually, they've really learned a lot this year. That's amazing. Um, and new machines are helping them. So bread makers and the banana bread trend and, and so on. Consumers of it's still cooking and they're enjoying the process of it. So what do you sort of see in terms of the convenience piece being integrated into home cooking? You know, I think you touched upon this a little bit like 
the, the tech and the appliances that we'll start to see in the homes. Do you have any sort of insights into that? What would the future trends in kitchens look like? Oh, smart kitchens. There, there are now products that can cook things that you would not have felt comfortable doing. So you're getting air fryers and you're getting new types of pressure cookers that aren't as sort of scary and complicated. And we are getting to a future where you will be able to do a bit of cooking, but your machine will do the rest. And I don't know, have you seen, Anik, have you seen any brands that have done some, you know, have entered this space because they realise that consumers are using machines more? Because... Yeah, some some of the young companies really see an opportunity there. Eh? Um, there's a Belgian company here and they, they have delivered something specifically for the young market where you have like a package like Deliveroo or like food bag, but then everything is frozen. You put it in your fridge, you have a machine and it works like uh, Obama, Marie, we say in Belgium, like mm-hmm. with hot water. And then you put it in the moment you want to, and then you have your really nice, amazing meal. And it's healthy, and it's easy, and you don't need to plan because they deliver it on a, on a weekly basis. Um, I do think when it comes to these smart kitchens, it's even twofold. Right? You have all these smart machines, but you still have the feeling, at least even I have as a housewife, that you want to do stuff yourself and have your herbs nicely. So there are some, some uh, companies who now have these indoor gardens, right? You have your basil just growing nicely green on the back of your kitchen. Looks even great when you have people coming over. Look how <laughs> healthy I am. Um, so, so yeah, there are a lot of opportunities there. I, I think... Um, it's always going to be a combination of both. Yes, we want to cook ourselves. We still think it is necessary in this time to sometimes get away from all the digital fuzz and whatever. So I prefer to get my food back once a week, nicely the ingredients and the amounts that I need for my meal instead of having to buy everything in bulk and then need yeah. to throw away half of it. So again, mm. sustainability thing. But however, on Friday here at home, Everybody wants Deliveroo. We're used to that. Yeah. On Friday, you sit down, you watch Star Wars, and you eat something easy. Yes, I agree. To, well, uh, Mandalorian. Um, there's a really cool <laughs> brand called Tavala um, who have made a smart oven. This is quite funky. And it's also a meal kit subscription company. So you get your meal kit, your oven scans your recipe card... So it knows what setting it needs to be, how hot, how long, and so on. You prep some of your ingredients in trays that they, in recyclable trays that they give you. Um, You pop them in your oven and you press go and it does all the work for you. But it's that connection between your actual, your piece of tech and, you know, scanning a, a card to tell you using a QR code and, you can think about all the opportunities for different brands to partner up with a company like that mm. and, and appliances like that. So that's quite fun. That's Tovala. Tovala, um, I'm who are that doing out. that. Um, yeah. um, what about 3D printing food? So, I mean, Anik, we've had like natural machines on in one of your rising food stars on, on the show as well. I mean, do you think that people are, in the future are going to be comfortable just kind of pressing a button and having all their food printed? Yes, but it will take a while and it will be a certain population. I, we even have redefined meat. They do the same, but then mm. 3D printing of meat, which is even more questionable. Mm. Um, although I really love what they do and how they do it. Huh? So we have some companies working on that. I do think specifically on natural machines, there's definitely an opportunity there. Not necessarily in each of our households. I'm not a fan of having a kitchen full of machines doing all individual stuff. But if you can have a technology that can Make I'm just saying something, elder people or people in in a hospital having Mm. the possibility to eat something that looks the way they are used to see it, Mm. but has a much easier taste or an easier way of swallowing it, added to what nutrition that they need. I think there's definitely an opportunity for that market. It will take a while. It will first go there and then probably it will be mainstream. Um, I know that a lot of consumers love to have their own devices to do every small step. Um, but that I, I believe that there's an opportunity there. It might take a little bit longer, again, because very often uh, all of us still think as 3D printing as something more mechanical yeah. um, instead of food that we then eat. But natural machines, again, as an extra example, they now made it even possible to print things that are immediately pre-cooked uh, because no, originally it was something cold and then you need to put it in your oven or wherever they they even managed to solve that problem wow oh wow and how long does that take do you know well it it depends i think some of the some of the things i can do in quite a short time um i don't know how 
your husband is cooking at home, Lakshmi, but at the <laughs> pace that my husband is doing it, probably for some things, 3D printing might be quicker. Uh, but, but very often at the moment, it's still used for the bigger things, right? Uh, everything that has to do with um, uh, food uh, servations at, in restaurants and so on. So um, I think something you picked out about, you know, 3D printing might be not so much of a opportunity inside people's homes, but there's really opportunity when you're eating out and in restaurants. I mean, this has been, I think the one, the main industry has been hit really hard, uh, but COVID has been, you know, the hospitality industry has been crippled. But who do you think is going to rise from the ashes here, Edward? Like, what do you, what are you seeing as the outcome of what's currently happened this year for the hospitality industry? Oh, it's, it's a hard one. Um, I guess it all depends on how quickly we can get back to it. There's, yeah. I guess there's going to be some opportunity where menus can, I think, stay simple, that restaurants should be an experience, that should be um, a talking point, that should be a social. Um, it's going to be tough, for I think, for some of the mainstream you know, restaurant chains, mm-hmm. I think, going forward because it's harder to sort of for them to tell a a fun story about it. One of the other sectors that I think will continue to do well, we've seen as a result of this year, um, food tourism become a big thing. Whether people will be traveling in the next couple of years is a question. Mm -hmm. There will be some hit back. We're going to be traveling again, but, you know, we're we're probably in an economic struggle at the same time. And the opportunity for new cuisines and a bit more nuanced flavors to grow, um, I think consumers will will be looking for a new experience and a new flavor because they can't go abroad and have it abroad. Just wanted to connect as well, the last one, to your 3D printing one. I think patisseries and bakeries... Um, the opportunity to use things like 3D printers, to use waste ingredients mm. and stuff to to make something really elaborate and crazy and um, different. There's a really fun example from Tokyo, and I don't know if they actually launched in the end because of this year, called Sushi Singularity. I don't know if any of you read about these guys. You mm. send in um, a urine sample, you probably weren't going to say this, I, I, or a, I don't like where a this sample is going, of your Edward. saliva <laughs> to the restaurant in advance. They then are able to personalise based on your DNA and your. They can. They say they can read your diet and then personalise a product that perfectly suits you. And doing that in a restaurant experience is in its bonkers and crazy. It's very Tokyo, but that being able to really get this new, totally new experience from the restaurant industry, that's probably quite a premium option. Mm. Um, but I think experience is going to be key. And that one's just experience coupled with science, coupled with nutrition and everything. So look up the sushi singularity. Yeah. It is funky. Check that out. I mean, that you're talking amazing. about things which are bonkers. I mean, uh, is there any <laughs> other kind of, I was going to say weird, but are there any uh, other trends out there which maybe feel too far out there but actually, it's going to be one of these things where in five years we look back and it's like, well, obviously, we're going to be doing urine tailored <laughs> restaurant food. Um, are there any are there any other things that we haven't covered here that you think, you know what, this is something which is emerging, which we should be aware of? On that subject, um, there is new tech that we're potentially getting to a future where we'll be able to breathe on our phones and our phones to tell us about you know, not only you know, our diets and what we should be eating, what our deficiencies are, um, but also potentially talk to us about flavours that we like. You might be able to lick your phone and and, and get those sort of experiences. Um, and that idea that you can really personalise your, your diet and experience. And that tech, um, potentially coupled with this growth of stuff like online gaming, um, VR sets and, and so on, um, where consumers will be able to... Um, taste and eat products that they're seeing in the sort of digital world and the gaming world that they're in. Um, We know there are games out there now where you you go sort of hunting for food and drink ingredients in a game and then you you, you end up making a meal and it boosts your character's power in some way. But actually being able to taste that as an opportunity using the tech that's there. That's a bonkers one if you wanted to think about one. Yeah, Um, that's a good bonkers uh, one. There's, a think, the film Ready Player One that they launched a few years ago, which sort of showed Mm. us what the future might be like. It might actually be like that. Yeah, yeah, okay, I like that. And what about you, Alec? I mean, are there any... I mean, we were talking about sort of almost moving into, like, taste and food pairing as one of your startups territory, but is there anything anything sort of weird and wonderful that you're you're keeping an eye on? 
Well, I think what, what strikes me in everything that has to do with personalized nutrition, it's always for, or it's mainly focused for the consumer who already has everything and just wants to make it even more easier or more exclusive, more whatever. Um, so when you, I think Foodbank is the perfect example. They host an event uh, two weeks ago and what they do is they pair specific flavors. So it makes, they put weird things together, but they have some data analytics on it. So it really sounds like amazing in your mouth. And what they did is they reached out to hospitals where you have uh, patients who have problems with swallowing mm -hmm. and they made very specific prolines uh, whereby they had this flavoring because these people, they also have problems in tasting specific flavors. And so they were able to develop a proline which has extra saliva. It's like artificial saliva, but has this amazing taste within the throat. And for these wow. patients, it was like they hadn't eaten something like that for 10 or 15 years. Wow. I, I hope for me that personalized nutrition will also go there uh, mm. because we, we have it all, right? We're healthy, we're, we, we, we can eat whatever we want, we can afford it, but there's still such a big part of the population who doesn't have it. Mm -hmm. I think if mm -hmm. there, there would be amazing opportunities in personalizing that with an easy and affordable approach, I would be a fan of that. So looking forward to support also that. Awesome, okay, cool. love that. That's really fascinating. I've, we've just had this amazing trip through all these different areas. So I think I just want to sort of round up and you know Annick and I both work with startups so I'm going to focus on that like so Annick in, in terms of sentiments in terms of investments in the agri-food sector going to 2021 so for the entrepreneurial types out there where would you place your money like the big things coming out uh, I think you asked me such a difficult question <laughs> actually. and and it was said in the beginning I think if all my rising food stars could really bet on me as a fortune teller I would be so rich <laughs> yeah. um so, and, and I do think, okay, there will be sectors who will get more attention and more money than other ones, but I can't choose. I, I have to be honest here. I, I have these, for me, it's more about these amazing teams behind these promising mm. technologies, and it's much more than that. So I think a lot will happen now in the alternative meat uh, space, mm. alternative proteins, as well as meat. We've seen that, that that's going to be explode, but I'm sure there will be other fields. Um, it's about betting your money on the ones you believe in and let go of all the hypes and the trends coming up. Um, I think that's a, an important one. And do you think it's going to be easier? I mean, harder? I mean, it sounds we just went through so many opportunities, but what do you think easier or harder for, for securing funding? Well, I think it's double. We have more and more investors now looking into the space. But of course, with all these opportunities, we will also have more and more startups who will start yeah. buzz and, and have these opportunities. I think for the more mature companies, it hopefully will be easier. We have more investors looking into Series A, Series B, and there the amount of companies available, amount of qualitative companies available is still quite limited. So I hope for the best and hope it will be better next coming years. Yeah, and for all the investors out there listening, you know, this is a great space to be in at the moment. So lots of innovation happening. So uh, come on down. Yeah. <laughs> Always welcome. Yeah. And Edward, you know, so maybe less on the startup space, but if you could, let's say, champion like one single biggest or most exciting innovation category or trend, you know, what, what are you really looking forward to next year? What do you hope will happen? I want to find a way for flavor, for stuff that tastes amazing to align itself with stuff that has values. We've had a really tough year from political reasons and also health and and I think that, you know, consumers want to find, they, they love aligning themselves with brands and they also like talking about them, but brands that can get a consumer's ethical side that, that are really out there to try and help people. And at the same time, they taste amazing. Mm. Um, there are brands that are trying to do it and that are doing it, um, but that's what, that's the type of brand that I want to see. Okay. Um, you know, brands, really brands that can do it all. <laughs> <laughs> no i think it's yeah well, well yeah but it's got to taste good but they've got to have a story to tell and they've got to have a, a reason to purchase more than just the taste of it and the fact that it's cheap uh i think that they've got to have both yeah totally good. better for the planet better for us but since still something we really would like to eat right yes yes yeah. no, still something that sense. makes me smile yeah yeah sounds like the holy grail but i completely align with you there 100 percent. and you know finally the really important question here Banana bread, fat or trend? 
<laughs> what do you think, Edward? Well, it was a bit of a, probably a bit of a, a fad. There'll be another thing. We're now into sourdoughs, people growing their own sourdoughs. Um, I invested in a very posh coffee machine and I'm making my own you know, latte art at the moment. That's probably a fad too. Um, so no, a bit of a fad. There'll be another bakery item next year that we'll be into. <laughs> that will be all be 3D printing. With, so with, yeah, absolutely. With cheap bread, obviously. <laughs> Hope so. Ah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the future just sounds so delicious. Yeah, it does. Now, now I'm hungry. Um, so, yeah, amazing. Annick and Edward, you know, it, this has been such a pleasure talking Thank to you, you so both much. and a real, a real standout episode. And it's just really nice to finish the year, given the year that we've had on something which is a lot more positive and upbeat as well, particularly for the agri-food sector, which is, you know, we've we've been through some some a bumpy ride this year, so it's good to look forward. So thank you very much to both of you for that. Um, where can people find out more about your work? Edward? So you can go to mintel.com and, you know, straight away see what we do. You can get our podcast, Mintel Little Conversation, that I sometimes host. Um, and, you know, often we'll be thrown in the press and different things, consumer stats and so on, or you can just, you know, find us and, and get in touch with us on the LinkedIn's and so on. But um, we're always here to help. Thanks. And what about you, Anik? Where can people find out more about uh, your work with the Rising Food Stars? Well, they can definitely find out much more on the EID Food uh, channels, uh, but there's also risingfoodstars.eu and hashtag Rising Food Stars on Twitter also. It gives a good overview of all the amazing scale-ups that we support. Great stuff. So, yeah, just thank you both very much for your time sure. today and for your amazing insights. Um, so I just wanted to say thanks to you, Ed. Thank you very much for having me. It's been great. And thanks very much, Anik. Same here. It was really fun. Great stuff. And if you want to uh, check EIT Food out, please go to eitfood.eu forward slash podcast or uh, also check us out on Twitter at EIT Food. So you've been listening to the Food Fight podcast and it's just down to me to say keep fighting for a better food future. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks, everyone.